you're there, maybe. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Where are you all Zooming from? It's 7 a.m. in California. Where is it everywhere that you are? Put in the chat. So today um, we have uh, a, a day with another <clears throat> theme for you. Yesterday was was the day of spins. Today is the day uh, on exciton energy transfer. So you're going to learn what an exciton is. You're going to learn what is meant when people say energy transfer. So Susanna, do you want to, to do the honors? Yeah, sure. All right. Good morning. Welcome. Um, yeah, as Cleary said, we're going to be talking about exciton uh, transfer today. And our first talk is going to be given by uh, Professor Greg Scholes, who's joining us from Princeton University. And he's going to introduce us to, to some of these ideas. Are you able to uh, share your screen, Greg? Yeah, I think so. And remind me, what? how long does it go? Till 11, a rat told me. Is that right? Uh, your lecture for an hour, yes. Yeah. I'm not sure what time zone you're in. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Um, all right. There we go. Okay. Well, welcome, everybody. Yeah. I'm going to talk about electronic energy transfer. And to start with, I'll talk a bit about where you see it in biology. Um, just to give some context, um, it's been widely studied in biology, <clears throat> specifically and mostly in photosynthesis. <clears throat> so we've all we're all taught about photosynthesis probably in primary school, um, and we write down this overall reaction for it. Um, many of you will know that it's better to think of photosynthesis as these two separate reactions. Um, and they're like two cogs in a machine is in that they're connected by the flow of electrons. And this is how you have two enzymes, one so amazingly oxidizing and the other so reducing. Um, when we zoom in on one of those cogs in the wheel, one that splits water, we get a, a, a map like this that can be resolved in the membranes across which photosynthesis happens. And we see a bunch of proteins um, and the key enzyme, which is shown in two ways in this picture. Um, uh, I'm not sure if I can point or not. Yes, not. Um, but this is photosystem two, it's labeled at the bottom there and it's labeled underneath the version with the protein stripped away. So you can see the chromophores and just above it slightly to the right, it's the same thing with the protein. And these other proteins all around there contain chlorophyll also, but they are not directly involved in the water splitting. In other words, they, they don't, um, they don't do redox chemistry at all, unlike the reaction center. And all they do is absorb light and funnel that light to the reaction center. And the reason for that is that um, sunlight's pretty dilute source of excitation. And this reaction center um, needs to absorb light frequently enough that it can um, rotate 
um, metaphorically speaking, between the four states it needs in order to split water. So it needs four photons to split water. It needs to push four reactions forward and prevent the back reactions. So you've got to have that flux of photons high enough. And the only way to do that is to amplify the incident sunlight. And that's what these other prote proteins do. So all in all, there's hundreds of chlorophylls collectively absorbing the sunlight. And for this to work, anywhere that the sunlight's absorbed, you can see it with the little um, lightning um, icon up there. Uh, it's absorbed in one of the chlorophylls. That excitation energy needs to jump chlorophyll to chlorophyll and make its way to photo excite the reaction center. And this is the energy transfer that I'll talk about. Um, what's amazing about this is that 90% at least of the absorbed photo excitations do produce an electron transfer reaction at the reaction center. <clears throat> and each time this happens, the energy jumps chlorophyll to chlorophyll um, on average about 2000 times. So this is an incredibly efficient process overall. Uh, and keep in mind that there's a time limit for all of this to happen. It's not like sending electricity down a power line excited state lifetime of chlorophylls four nanoseconds so here's the stop clock that you're running against so each of these energy jumps has got to be pretty quick in order to beat that clock and that's what i'll talk about how that happens <clears throat> so i can give you another picture of to give you a sense for how important light harvesting is here <clears throat> and quantitatively it's been known for decades takes 2,500 chlorophylls to make one oxygen molecule. <clears throat> Part of that is this fact that you have to provide the four photo excitations in sequence. Um, and when you divide that out, you get the physical number of chromophores that I showed you. <clears throat> um, but here's a, here's a picture of, of it. it. It shows the chlorophyll at the bottom um, of this um, tube from the centrifuge, a sucrose gradient, showing uh, the chlorophylls in the reaction center. The chlorophylls in the enzyme, or if you like, solar cell of photosynthesis, is light green line with that bottom arrow points to. And compare that with the dark green band, which is just light harvesting proteins. <clears throat> so here's a big difference between photosynthesis and a typical organic solar cell is this this crucial importance of light harvesting. So whenever you look at any photosynthetic organism, whether it's a plant, these were isolated from a plant, these proteins um, or, an, or algae or photosynthetic bacteria, the color you're seeing is the light harvesting protein. And in this case, it's LHC2, which binds 45 chlorophylls in each of these protein trimers. Um, so chlorophyll A and B and the LHC2 complex isn't the only game on the planet here for light harvesting. In fact, it's remarkably diverse. And there's all of these structures that you see in the circles um, of light harvesting complexes found in nature. And each one of them has particular properties. Um, what's most obviously tuned is the absorption spectrum. So the, the spectrum of light that's being absorbed that powers photosynthesis. You see it goes from the near infrared <clears throat> right through the visible um, to the blue with the dinoflagellates, which is on, shown on the left there. So there's all of these different structures all work equally well um, that we can study. Some of them bind you know, the light harvesting proteins individually bind maybe eight chromophores, <clears throat> some of them <clears throat> um, uh, tens of chromophores, and some of them like the second one from the right, 200,000 chromophores in a kind of molecular aggregate. There's all different strategies here. And this is why scientists have studied these proteins. We know because of the crystal structures that you see here, we know exactly where the light absorbing chromophores are. <clears throat> um, we can measure the light harvesting and the energy transfer using various experiments quantitatively. And because of the structure, we can do theoretical calculations to see if we can predict what we measure. And that way we learn some features of energy transfer. And here's some lessons that have been learned 
um, that are discussed in this paper cited here from 2011. <clears throat> um, so um, the first one, concentration of excitation. So this is what I mentioned here. This is the idea of the light harvesting complexes. You've got to amplify <clears throat> the rate that the reaction centers are photo excited. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> secondly, the chromophores that are involved here in these proteins, they're not, you know, they're not <clears throat> um, chromophores with an extinction coefficient of 10,000. These have extinctions of 100,000. These are <clears throat> very highly absorbing chromophores. And <clears throat> the nature has worked out that subtle um, chemical modifications of the porphyrin ring structure turns it from a hopeless light absorber and the visible to a fantastic one. Um, <clears throat> this optimized energy landscape, this is to do with how the energy is able to flow through these hundreds of chromophores bound in the proteins and get to the reaction center. The idea is that you don't want sinks for the energy. In other words, low energy chromophores in these proteins that would siphon off some of the excitation and reduce the efficiency. Um, in some of the proteins like PS1, actually there are some um, curious red absorbing chromophores, but typically that's not the case. <clears throat> um, high concentration of chromophores in the proteins, and I'll talk a bit more about that from physical chemistry point of view, but it it's incredibly hard to get chromophores at this concentration without precise control of their position and orientation. If you try to do this randomly, <clears throat> the easiest way to do this is to make a solution at the same concentration <clears throat> as chromophores in these light harvesting complexes, and it will be completely non-fluorescent. <clears throat> You'll get something called concentration quenching. In other words, the excited state lifetime now, instead of being four nanoseconds for chlorophyll, will be so short, be picoseconds, you can never move energy anywhere. And the last point is this is all highly regulated. When the light's too bright, the energy, the excitation energy is diverted and um, turned into harmless heat, um, avoiding producing reactive oxygen species and so on. Um, in order to regulate photosynthesis. So this is an amazing machine. Last part I won't talk about anymore, but here's, <clears throat> I guess, the framework for what I want to say today. And that is um, the basic theory for this energy, where we're imagining one of the chromophores, a red colored anthracene here is photo excited. <clears throat> um, and the energy transfer means that this chromophore is de-excited and synchronously the excitation ends up somewhere else. So it doesn't, in this limit that we're talking about, it doesn't emit a photon that is reabsorbed. <clears throat> the maximum efficiency of that process is 50%. Um, instead, this is non-radiative process and can be 100% efficient. Um, and the ingredients in the theory, called first theory, to predict this, um, uh, best seen on the left side of the equation here, which is obviously a Fermi golden rule type equation. And apart from the constants at the front, there's two ingredients. One is electronic coupling. It's the modular squared part. So that means there's a weak interaction between the photo excited molecule and each of the ground state ones. <clears throat> Oftentimes we call that the dipole dipole interaction between transition dipole moments. That's the approximation in first theory. And that's multiplied by this thing I've labeled J, which is spectral overlap, which I'll show you at some point, I think, um, which just means that the fluorescent spectrum of the donor overlaps with the absorption spectrum of the acceptor. In other words, we can transfer energy and, conser and conserve energy, uh, which of course is <clears throat> essential. On the right-hand side, you see it written more, maybe familiar to many of you, is more in the first picture here um, in terms of this critical transfer distance R0, which is a parameter. <clears throat> and um, the explicitly thinking about the dipole-dipole approximation, it gives you this one on R to the six distance dependence characteristic of energy transfer. 
<clears throat> and what I'll say about this, this, these equations which are equivalent and this first a theory is that um, it is almost always a really fantastic approximation for energy transfer. Um, and in some cases, especially when um, the spectra have strong vibronic bands in them, progressions and so on, it's a better approximation than some of the very sophisticated methods um, <clears throat> which are developed based on the idea that the um, exciton phonon coupling needs to be not too strong. Okay, so <clears throat> what limits? I'll come back to the first theory, but first a couple of words. Well, often people talk about exciton diffusion length, how far can excitation go? Um, what are the limits for that? Um, at the end of the day, um, it's going to be limited by the excitation lifetime. I mentioned it was four nanoseconds for chlorophyll. <clears throat> and compared with that, the rate of each of the energy transfer jumps from whatever is the donor to whatever is the acceptor. And, it's, and, and that's really going to limit our random walk. And there's not too many ways of getting around this. Um, in terms of the speed, if you want, of, of the, because um, we often talk about rates of the energy transfer jump, if you want to think about a speed for this, <clears throat> it's pretty similar, um, and, and, and it is in first a theory, um, the speed of sound in the medium that we're talking about. Um, so, uh, ah, here we go. So let's have a look at this. We can calculate the limits of diffusion length. Um, just considering a 2D lattice of a thousand chromophores with one trap somewhere in there. <clears throat> the trapping of the excitation here, you can work out just from random walk theory, equilibrium theory. Uh, it's going to take, I mentioned this earlier, about 2000 energy jumps is going to happen in the excited state lifetime. And the total distance the excitation travels is an amazing 2.2 microns, but the diffusion length is only 30 nanometers in this simulation, okay? Because it doesn't get very far. It goes backwards and forwards and shuffles around. Um, if you could spread or direct that excitation, which is shown on the left here with some kind of correlation, saying that if I go forward in one direction, I'm more likely to continue going forward, then you could really extend that diffusion length. So this random walk is an issue. Um, <clears throat> here's coming back to the point um, uh, of those five lessons about light harvesting I mentioned before that can quantify what I was saying here. Here's the concentration of chlorophyll in these light harvesting complexes from higher plants. LHC2, it's a quarter of a molar concentration. It's unbelievable. You know, even at a tenth of this concentration in solution, you'll get concentration quenching and no significant energy migration. <clears throat> so the organization of these chromophores, the chlorophylls here in the protein, um, it, it is... Uh, we imagine at least optimal. The distances between the chromophores here are between eight and twelve nanometer, eight and twelve angstroms typically in this protein. All right, so you know, if we were in person, you could interrupt and ask questions, but it's kind of hard on the screen because I don't see anybody. But um, we'll have questions at the end. I'm not going to talk for the whole hour. <clears throat> All right, here's a little timeline, if you like, for some history of energy transfer. Um, and I'll go into some of these um, advances. It was <clears throat> observed um, at this pretty early on in the last century, in the 20th century, um, by looking at concentration quenching. Okay, this was the way people first studied energy transfer. So they knew that yeah, the concentration quenching is so effective because some of the chromophores form these aggregates, which are the quenching sites, but the energy jumps from between the other chromophores to get to the quenching sites. You only need a small concentration actually of the quenches um, to get really good quenching of the fluorescence. And we see that in aromatic 
polymers like polystyrene as well. Um, it was in 1929, so not that long after the quantum mechanical theory was developed, that a quantum mechanical model for this mechanism of the energy transfer was proposed. And this is the what we call the dipole-dipole coupling, or I'll show you, you know, it a bit more rigorously than that. But this is a quantum mechanical mechanism, and I'll explain why later. Um, it was in the 40s that these scientists, especially in Russia, but also Furster, <clears throat> doing experiments, realized the condition of the spectral overlap. As I mentioned, that energy conservation condition, the fluorescent spectrum needs to, uh, of the donor overlaps the absorption of the acceptor. And I'm going to come back to some interesting discussion points about that at the end here. It's in the 30s that energy transfer in biological systems was first studied as energy transfer within proteins. And then, of course, first as 1948 paper was the masterwork in all of this, where he brought everything together with a theory. Uh, the genius of the theory is that you, you only need to put in experimental observables and you can predict the rate of energy transfer. <clears throat> all right, so <clears throat> a little bit more to start with about the spectral overlap, just to make sure everybody gets what this looks like. So you understand, of course, and I'll show you a picture when I say the emission spectrum of the donor overlaps the absorption of the acceptor. <clears throat> what this means is that there's going to be some coupled vibronic transitions um, in the donor fluorescent spectrum. For, so for instance, the short arrows here, um, the one from the S1 of the donor to the high vibronic band of the ground state, that's going to transfer energy to the S0 to S1 transition in the acceptor as I've drawn it, and so on. So these arrows get correlated like this. This is how the, 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 a good coarse grain picture of how the spectral overlap works. Um, and that's all written, as I said, I wrote it as J in that first equation. Now I'm starting to um, give a little bit more detail here. You see we're integrating some function here that carries that information about how the spectra overlap. <clears throat> and I'll show you what that is. So spectral overlap is a number. Um, in the, in the case that we're using units of wave numbers, centimeters to the minus one for the coupling, then it has units of centimeters, a strange unit. <clears throat> um, okay, and I'll come back to the that spectral overlap, um, I guess, at some point. Um, so <clears throat> the first thing that people looked at, and they looked at for many decades, actually, starting really with Dexter's paper, they thought about, <clears throat> well, when we can't predict energy transfer rates accurately compared to our experiment, the thing that we must be doing wrong is making that dipole approximation. And so we need to get more accurate electronic coupling. So this was the first target for improving the theory. <clears throat> um, and one of the first things that was looked at, in, and this was initially in Dexter's paper was Ah, well, what if the molecules or the atoms in Dexter's case were so close together <clears throat> that the orbitals physically overlap between donor and acceptor? So that's a situation that you are familiar with. Anytime you have electron transfer, then there's overlapping orbitals, of course, right? Whether they're overlapping directly or by through bond interactions, it's still overlap of the orbitals. <clears throat> um, Dexter's theory, um, it's good to call this Dexter energy transfer, but Dexter's theory is specific to atoms and is not exactly how it works for molecules. Um, although how we interpret Dexter's formulation um, is correct. So, um, so there's various ways of thinking about that. Let me put it this way, but how physically um, the rigorous way that the orbital overlap works here 
the dominant contribution is not this exchange interaction for molecules. Um, it is this, um, it, it's, it can be a sequence of electron transfers, um, or it can be a quantum mechanical version of that. This is how you represent mixing in valence bond model. And the reason we do it like this is because we've decided to localize the wave functions to define a donor. In this case, it's written as A and accept it written as B. And that way we can say the excitation is on the donor, which is A, a star here. And when the excitation is on the donor and not on the acceptor and nothing else is happening, the configuration we have is A star B. <clears throat> but what happens when the orbitals interact is we need to mix into that wave function this, this sharing of the electron density, and that's represented in valence bond theory as these charge transfer configurations. So they're not necessarily real. <clears throat> they don't lead to charge transfer because normally they're higher energy in, in the case of energy transfer, type one heterostructures and semiconductors, um, but they provide this orbital overlap contribution um, by a kind of super exchange formalism, if anybody's familiar with that. And this is what enables the energy to move without the dipole approximation, in some cases, simply through the orbital overlap. So you move one electron and the second electron um, quantum mechanically, and you end up with the excitation magically moved from A to B. Uh, um, and so the other, <clears throat> don't worry about the equations here. Um, this is to remind me to say that, you know, that an another point about this that is often forgotten um, or not realized um, is that you don't, in almost every case, except in specific examples, you don't have, well, the energy transfer happens by a dipole type approximation, the columbic interaction, it's called more generally, or <clears throat> by orbital overlap contributions. So that would be, an example of that would be if we measure rates of energy transfer, and we know that if it's first to type the rate as a function of the distance between the chromophores, we'll have a one on R to the six distance dependence. In the case of orbital overlap, it will be an exponential distance dependence. <clears throat> Therefore, if we could plot the rate versus the distance between the chromophores, we could differentiate this dipole-dipole versus um, orbital overlap contribution. And that's sometimes done in the literature. This this is only going to work in special cases because normally both of them are operative. Okay, there's no reason why they should, one should exclude the other. That's what I want to point out here. And you can see it in the calculation here. It's a calculation of the couplings. It goes as one on R cubed, not one on R to the six. It's just a picture here that you want to look at. It's a separation between two naphthalene molecules and a calculated electronic coupling, the total coupling on the y-axis, which is a log scale. And you see when the molecules are close together, less than five angstrom apart, you get this steep exponential um, distance dependence of the excitation energy at this of the matrix element for energy transfer. And, and in this regime, the orbital overlap contributions dominate. So they can give really strong um, couplings. And then when the molecules are more um, distantly spaced, then we the orbital overlap effects die down and we're left just seeing the one on R cubed dipole-dipole interactions. And you see there's this interplay <clears throat> and the key distance here is in the, that regime here of five angstrom or less. And, and it, the matrix elements can get complicated by the short range effects. Um, so let's have a look at, so just to quickly summarize in, this is the first way that the first theory could break down that people thought about, ah, orbital overlap. The second thing, and actually it was also in Dexter's paper, <clears throat> thought about, well, okay, well, what if my transition dipoles, for instance, are small, or the molecules are close together, like in this five to six angstrom regime there. Um, does my 
dipole-dipole approximation breakdown, which it could, it's based on a kind of Taylor expansion. Um, and so at short range, you may need higher multipole um, contributions here, which is what people initially thought about. Um, what we could do is just go straight to a, in principle, exact calculation of that coupling and not make a multipole expansion. And, I, and one of the things that we find, I'll, which I'll tell you about, one of the things we find out when we do that is that the multipole expansion is hopeless. So either the dipole approximation works or it doesn't work. It's the end of the day. <clears throat> if it doesn't work, you need to consider the whole transition density <clears throat> that contributes to these Coulomb interactions. So let me explain that. Where the transition dipole comes from is a purely quantum mechanical effect. You can't think of, there's no classical analogy to this. Okay, you know it's the, the transition dipole is the observable of the, um, the ground state wave function and the excited state wave function sandwiched around the dipole operator. Um, now, what we can do, we can reformulate that in terms of a density, and then also take the observable of the dipole if we want. And when we do that, we can draw a picture of what that quantity looks like that we're going to get the transition dipole of. Okay, so it's a it, it looks like um, a classical charge distribution. And you know, if you had a classical charge distribution, and it was polarized, so it was like slightly negative on one side, slightly positive on the other. You're going to get a, you know, a good size dipole um, moment for that charge distribution. Well, here's a picture of the transition density of a billion molecule from photosynthesis. <clears throat> it's, it's not molecular orbitals; it's the transition density. And when we apply the dipole operator to that density, we get the transition dipole that you see in spectroscopy. But this is what the neighboring molecule is looking at. And it's a Coulomb interaction between this, one on R interaction between this crazy looking you know, positive and negative density thing that the other molecule is looking at. So if the other molecule is way far away, <clears throat> you know, it will see this in the distance <clears throat> and it will really just look like the first moment of the distribution, the dipole. But when it's close, it resolves detail. Okay, and I think I have some pictures of this. Maybe this is a good one here. Here's the picture showing that if I take the dipole, if I apply the dipole operator to each of these transition densities, I'll get um, a point dipole, actually. So I've drawn big arrows here, but they actually have no length at the center of each of the of the center of mass, if you like, or the center of charge of each of these distributions. And that's what we would do in first of theory. But you can see that as that chlorophyll on the right comes close to the carotenoid, which is this long molecule. By the way, if you look at the carotenoid, you can see the purple um, color in the transition density on the bottom and the orange dominates on the top. That's showing you the direction of the transition dipole. The same you can see with the bacterial chlorophyll. When that chlorophyll comes close, <clears throat> um, especially if I bring it close to the tip of the carotenoid, um, it's the Coulomb interactions, which go as one on R, are really going to be dominated by the chlorophyll seeing one end of the carotenoid and not the other. And this is what the breakdown of the dipole approximation means, is how to think about it. It's the shapes of the molecules resolving the shapes of the other molecules. And this is quite different than the dipole approximation in spectroscopy. In spectroscopy, we're using light as a ruler. <clears throat> you know, these molecules are a few angstrom in size and uh, the ruler of light has a resolution of 500 nanometers, a thousand of times the size of these. So it will always just average out the dipole. Molecule, on the other hand, has quite fine resolution. It doesn't do that averaging. Okay, so the top equation um, is just uh, formalizes how you take the Coulomb interaction between transition densities. And so you're tracing around 
<clears throat> you've got a ruler from every little point on the donor molecule to every point on the acceptor and you trace that around then move it on the donor trace it around again okay so it's these two integrals one with respect to the r1 one with respect to r2 <clears throat> if we do the averaging first then calculate the coupling that's the equation at the bottom of the second bottom equation that's the dipole approximation Okay, so it's a little bit, if you want to think about it, it's the order in which we decide to average over the shapes here. Oh, um, and now you say, okay, well, that's all very well. It sounds kind of somewhat complicated maybe, but you know, do I have to care about it ever? Um, <clears throat> well, it turns out you do, especially in some of these photosynthetic proteins. You can see <clears throat> some examples here. If you look at the numbers, let's look at the second one from the left on the top where you see that the dipole approximation gives it a coupling of 72 wave numbers this is between um, the bacteria chlorophyll the blue one labeled b and c alpha <clears throat> um, and when we do this transition density cube calculation the more accurate version you get 104 wave numbers so okay it's not so bad but have a look at the next one along to the right here um, the dipole approximation gives minus 15 wave numbers. Transition density cube gives 45 plus 45. Okay, so it's not only three times the magnitude, the sign is wrong. <clears throat> and you can see this trend, there's, there is no trend um, here. It's very unpredictable. Um, and you need to worry about this when the shapes of the molecule, as I said, or the sizes of them are comparable to the distance, but it can make a big it can have a big effect. Um, even more <clears throat> remarkably, um, I was showing you the transition density. It's the same picture as this one on the right here for the S0 to S2 carotenoid transition. This is the big strong one you see in the blue-green uh, uh, that makes the carotenoids orange to look at. But their lower excited state, this famous 2AG state, is dipole forbidden, this S0 to S1 transition. Um, so it has no transition dipole moment. So traditionally we say, ah, so if, if I've relaxed to the 2AG state of the carotenoid, these carotenoids are in, these are the same carotenoids that are right here in the LH2 complex of purple bacteria, um, then I can't have dipole-dipole, first a coupling. Um, so if I do have energy transfer, it has to happen by orbital overlap. But amazingly, <clears throat> this is not true. And I mentioned this before when I go back to this picture. Look at chlor chlorophyll C alpha or B beta. <clears throat> they're really close to the tip of that carotenoid. There's no way they're going to take a fair average over the transition density of that whole molecule. <clears throat> and in fact, they don't. And the, and the electronic coupling between them and the carotenoid turns out to be the same pretty much whether the carotenoid's in that bright S2 state or the completely dark S1 state. So they average away the symmetry that gives it a zero dipole. So we get very strong first to energy transfer, even though the state's completely dark. Um, one quick quantitative mention here of the short range interactions, those that depend on orbital overlap, they're often harder to calculate and get a sense here, the center to center separations of these different pairs of molecules in, this is also in purple bacteria, LH2. Um, you can see the order between 10 and 20 angstrom, more or less. <clears throat> um, at 20 angstrom, the short range or the orbital overlap dependent coupling is zero, essentially. But even at 10 angstrom for these particular molecules, is center to center 10 angstrom. You know, we're getting 50, 60 wave numbers of coupling. You know, it's pretty significant. That's actually because you see in that boxed region, these the A alpha and A beta bacterial chlorophyll, the um, the edges of the of the conjugated rings are approaching um, to within around four angstrom. Um, and an, <clears throat> another final contribution here to that coupling it's which is in first a 
theory is this little s here, which I never mentioned, s times v. V is the coupling I've been talking about. S is the dielectric screening. In first theory, we sometimes might forget that it's associated with the coupling. It screens the Coulomb interaction. Um, in, in first theory, we put it out the front and in the rate, it's one on the refractive index to the power of four, but it doesn't have to be that. That's again, valid only in the dipole approximation. Um, but it is telling us it's to do with the high frequency dielectric constant that's screening here, not, not not the static dielectric constant that you would um, you've been familiar with for in charge transfer. Um, so uh, uh, yeah, what this is based on accurate calculations from Benedetta Minucci's group with a, a, a computational method that they developed uh, a number of years ago now. Um, and you can see, by studying this that, um, sure, oftentimes the refractive index is a good approximation here, but when the dipole approximation doesn't work, it doesn't work, and the, the rate of energy transfer can be a factor of four different than what you would otherwise predict solely based on um, how you treat the dielectric medium, okay, the screening of the Coulomb interaction. Um, quite amazing, I'm not gonna go through um that because i'm just looking at the time here and there's something that i want to talk about at the end um but here's a here's a picture that might emphasize this this is pairs of chromophores from all sorts of, of um photosynthetic light harvesting complexes or also ps2 you see from the literature just to give examples <clears throat> um and the, the red and the blue ones, these are villains from um, uh, PC645, PE545, who you can see here, donor accept a separation when it's big. Um, the accurate calculation says, yes, the screening is one on N squared, okay? Um, that's in the coupling, right? So the rate will be one on N to the fourth. So that's all good, but as soon as the, chromophores become less than say 20 angstrom apart. Um, it becomes difficult to predict in the continuum model. You see the screening is less than what you predict from first to theory. Okay, and that is because of the, if you think about it, it's where the dial, it's, it's the arrangement of the dielectric compared to the arrangement of the chromophores. And it's to do with these, the trade-off of effects that contribute to this, which I won't go into. Um, I'll say one more thing about it. It gets even more crazy when you include the protein explicitly. Carlos Kuruchet developed how to do this atomistically. Um, really amazing work that he did, I have to say. And that's not because I'm a co-author on the paper. Um, he spent a long time on this. And um, what you find here as the effective dielectric constant in this protein for different pairs of chromophores, again, labeled here, um, can be, is completely quite unpredictable, let's say. And in fact, some of the chromophores are unscreened in the sense that their coupling is amplified by the dielectric environment. Um, and so I might leave it at that. As you add water, you end up ultimately with the screening. Um, let me look at the time, heavens. Okay, so let me see what I want to do. I want to leave time for questions. Okay, let's, I, I will mention the excitons though. So, so far we've been talking about molecules where it, it's a fair approximation to say the excitation sits on one chromophore and not the other nearby one. And that's what you need to have energy transfer in first theory. That's not always the case. And you see in these spectra here, absorption spectra of these two naphthalenes um, attached together by this bridge, <clears throat> that the absorption spectra does, does not look like that dashed line, the monomer, just the one naphthalene. It's split, it's crazily different. And this is because the states are quite different. Do I have a picture? Oh yeah. So um, because the electronic coupling now is strong, I'll go back to this picture though. Um, the actual 
wave functions that are absorbing the light are linear combinations of the excitation being on the left and the right side of the molecule. So we get the symmetric and anti-symmetric linear combination of those possibilities. Okay, just like, say, a pi and a pi star orbital. Um, but this is for the excitation being on the left or the right side of the molecule. And these new stationary states are split by two times the coupling. So this is giving you a sense of the size of the coupling. Um, and whether both states are allowed um, or one is allowed more than the other and so on depends on the orientation of the chromophores. I think many people know about this. Um, so the trick is, well, what happens now in our first theory if we have these excitons? What do we do? Um, do we abandon everything or is there a, a simple way forward? It turns out that there's a... A, a relatively simple way forward and that is what we need to do is imagine the two chromophores that are strongly coupled that's the special pair shown here with the, the purple and blue ones at the top of the left box <clears throat> if they're coupled to form an exciton state then we'll treat them collectively as a single chromophore in this case it's the acceptor of the energy from this bacteria chlorophyll that's the blue guy at the front of the box here and if we do that we can calculate the experimental energy transfer rate. If we try to treat the bacteria chlorophylls um, separately for energy transfer, or if we try to treat them in the dipole approximation, even worse, um, the whole thing is going to unravel. What happens with the dipole approximation here is we end up with, in this case, it's one of these examples here where um, one of the exciton states is allowed and the other is forbidden. And it's the forbidden state that the accept is the acceptor here. So according to the dipole approximation, that special pair does not is not a good energy acceptor. <clears throat> but the dipole approximation breaks down. Um, and you can show why that is here in the coupling, as a matter of fact. So the top equation is what I just said. If we couple the donor dipole to the um, the acceptor exciton state transition dipole we get zero because that mu plus has zero it, it, a magnitude of zero so there's no coupling but if we separate this and say aha uh -huh, well i have two exciton states approximately one on route two um, for the excitation being on the left minus or plus one on route two being on the right and we go through the simple algebra to work out the two contributions to the coupling, then we get something that's not zero. In fact, pretty close to experiment, even though we've actually used the dipole approximation here. We've just kept in mind that our acceptor is exotonic. So I'm going to skip through all of that. But um, the bottom line is that excitons typically... Uh, do not obey the dipole approximation, but you have to get down into the structure at the level of the mono, monomer chromophores making up the excitons. And, and this is where first the theory is wrong, typically by a factor of 10 in many of these examples. Okay, so the last thought I'll leave you with is <clears throat> more qualitative, um, coming back to the spectral overlap factor here. And coming back to experiments, of the kind a lot of people have looked at. This is just one example here of 2D electronic spectroscopy where um, interesting features have been seen in the dynamics using experiments like this that tell us that. Um, so the technical explanation is they're telling us that the donor emission spectrum, this is of the DBV molecules in this picture, the green ones, have correlations with the absorptions of the acceptor, the PCBs. <clears throat> so where, what's happening here is this, this, there's something to do with how we need to think about the J, the spectral overlap. Um, and so here's a picture of spectral overlap. As I said, it's just the emission overlapping with the acceptor. But think about the approximation that we're making when we do that. Okay, that spectra are not correlated and we'll simply make a histogram um, weighted by the amplitudes as to how they overlap and everything is normalized and so on. And that defines the spectral overlap. 
<clears throat> what the spectral overlap, where it comes from is these fluctuations of the transition energy of the donor and the transition energy of the acceptor. That's what gives absorption and emission line shapes. <clears throat> and if those fluctuations are uncorrelated and stochastic, this is the approximation of first to theory, um, then it's easy to formulate the spectral overlap as we normally do. But if they're correlated, and that can happen because the electronic coupling um, is, is not very, very small, they become correlated then because when the energy gaps, you can see in the lower trajectory, see how you, you see the part where they've changed, the trajectories have changed color. <clears throat> What's happened there is the, the, the energy of the donor and acceptor along this trajectory become close compared with the electronic coupling and you start to form the eigenstates, the exciton states briefly until they disappear. And this introduces correlations. This is what's measured in the 2D spectra. And so now you need a more complicated formulation of the spectral overlap. That's what ends up being in these more sophisticated quantum dynamics calculations at the end of the day. But this is, um, this is changing the, the energy transfer dynamics. And you know you can think about it. Even if the energy is hopping, okay, it doesn't need to be wave-like or any of this stuff. Even if it's hopping, the rate will be changed because the spectral overlap part of Furster's equation is not is going to be predicted differently. Um, so I'm going to skip that last thing also. Oh, and I guess that's everything. Um, and um, I think I I'll work out how to stop sharing. Maybe. Uh, well, you can start asking questions if you want while I try to work out where the button is. Uh, Thank you for that okay. talk, Greg. That was really interesting. And uh, you've got some questions already. Um, I've got a question from Douglas. I think I can let you unmute and you can ask. Hey, did, did that work? Yep. Yeah. yeah, great. So I have two questions. This is us. Uh, so that was great. I followed almost everything. I have two definition questions. One is the exciton. Usually the definition I see is the semiconductor version about electrons and holes. It sounds yeah. like you're using it in a different way. Right. So in the semiconductor way, <clears throat> we completely ignore my definition, because in semiconductors, they're typically ionic and the charge transfer states dominate. And just combinatorially, there's so many more of them. We can forget the electron being excited, say, for an S to a P orbital on one atom. It always goes to the neighboring atom. <clears throat> and we end up with this charge transfer picture of excitons. Um, and that's what ends up through some nice algebra this picture that you have of like hydrogen-like um, excitations in the semiconductor in what happens in molecules <clears throat> is typically the excitations are local so <clears throat> where ec the excitations are at each site and we're ignoring the charge transfer we don't have to but we are typically in this definition and so you end up with this they're called um, Frankel excitons and these 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 are what in the semiconductor picture then end up being um, the exchange fine splitting of the of the states. And then the definition though of an exciton is then two molecules that are uh, bound together quantum mechanically. Yeah, their excitations are quantum mechanically entangled. Yeah, two or more molecules. Oh. Okay. And then yeah, the other day, right. Okay. Yeah, great. It's like that's one of those things that everybody in the field knows and they never tell the rest of us. So um so that's helpful. In a, in a similar vein, the exchange reaction is what it, what's the definition there? Yeah, the definition of the exchange in this context also, which is different than the semiconductor one, is <clears throat> The dipole-dipole couplings are a Coulomb interaction between transition densities, as I said, and the exchange, which is negligible, by the way, 
is the exchange, um, the corresponding exchange correction to that Coulomb interaction. So what it is is we have to um, we have to switch the order of the functions in the integral there. So then we don't get um, we don't get the transition density. We get these we get a Coulomb interaction between these overlaps essentially between overlapping densities. I'd have to write it out for you probably. Well, what is it that's getting exchanged? It's the, <clears throat> so the Coulomb interaction, then if I write the orbitals as, I'll write it as, uh, think of it as A prime for the, for the LUMO and A for the HOMO, and then B and B prime for the, the other one. The Coulomb interaction is A prime A, so that transition density, I'm writing as a density, um, Coulomb interaction with B prime B or BB prime, if you want to write it. Okay, so that's that. And then if we switch A prime and, and, uh, and B, then we'll get the interaction between the overlap density of AB and A prime B prime. And so physically, it's sort of like which of the two guys is getting excited that's getting exchanged? It, it, what it is, it's just, it's just that we, it's an accounting that we have to do um, for the statistics, the, the statistics of the electrons in the slater determinants. So it's always there, but usually it's small. <clears throat> okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh, if you don't mind, we've also got one more question that was posted uh, in the question and answer chat, and that was uh, from Ravi which was, um, does exton transfer or quantum interactions more generally affect all FRET measurements, such as FRET measurements in proteins? Um, generally, when you do FRET measurements in proteins, you'll be designing where the fluorescent labels are gonna go. And then if, as long as, as long as the distance between them is larger than the size of those labels, then first the theory is going to be a good approximation. That's at the end of the day. I mean, sure, yeah, you could design systems where things don't work out so well, but usually you wouldn't do that. Or it's actually hard to do that. Thank you. Hopefully, Ravi, that answers your question. Um, Greg, thank you very much for keeping so nicely to time and for your excellent talk. Um, Pleasure. I think we'll, uh, we'll carry on for our next talk today. All right, great, thanks. Thank you. So our next talk is going to be given uh, by Dr. Arat Kaura. Um, and perhaps you can get on with your sharing your screen, Arat. Um, so Arat's background maybe gives you a little bit of an idea about how interdisciplinary this field of quantum biology is, because not only has he moved around between India, Canada and America, but he's also moved between uh, chemistry, biology and physics. Um, he's currently working uh, with our previous speaker with Greg Scholes in Princeton, um, and he's going to talk to us today about um, energy, electronic energy migration in microtubules um, specifically. So over to you, Arat. Thank you, Susanna. Um, all right, so um, before we begin uh, this discussion on uh, electronic energy migration in microtubules, um, I, thought I'd, I'd, I thought I'd just start off uh, giving you um, some background on microtubules uh, for the first part of the talk. And for the second part of the talk, um, I talk about some experiments uh, that have been done on microtubules uh, and focus a little bit of, on my own work. Um, uh, this talk will not be discussing um, some more controversial aspects of microtubules, um, uh, such, as, uh, such as their rules in, uh, uh, in cognition uh, or, or super radiance or, or consciousness. Uh, okay, however, this, this will be uh, talking about um, quantum effects in microtubules. Okay, so um, I've uh, I hope for this interaction um, 
this, this talk that I'm going to give to be interactive. Okay. And so I'm going to ask you a few questions in the middle of the talk. Um, and hopefully this improves our understanding. Okay. So um, do you guys know what this is? Um, this is a neuron, right? Um, however, do you guys know what this is? And anyone can answer. Do you want them to answer in the chat, Eric? Because I think people can't unmute themselves. Ah, okay. Yeah, feel free to feel free to say something. Cell division. That's right, Marco. Okay, so this is a dividing cell. That was that was relatively easy. It's a mitotic cell. Uh, what's this? Uh, traveling cell is the closest. Yes. So. Yes. So these are, uh, it, it is, it is a, it is a, it is a, it is a traveling cell. It's a, it's a, it's a fibroblast that's, that's migrating. Okay. Now these are three um, dramatically different cell uh, shapes. And all these shell shapes um, are, um, are designed by what's called the cytoskeleton. Okay. Which, uh, which roughly means the cell skeleton, right? Cytoskeleton. Um, the two key players in the cytoskeleton that determines the, the, the morphology of the shell of the cell um, are shown here. In white, we have uh, microtubules. Okay, so this is the edge of a cell, um, and the white polymers you see are microtubules, and they're made up of tubulin. Okay, and the polymers in purple are actin filaments. Okay, and um, this is they look like this. Um, they made up of the protein actin. Okay. Um, and so actin filaments and microtubules uh, determine cell shape. And, the, and the, the dramatic differences in cell shape we see um, are governed by the cytoskeleton. Okay. Um, now this talk is going to focus on microtubules. Okay. So um, a typical microtubule has 13 protofilaments. Okay. So a microtubule is cylindrical and it has 13 columns of this protein uh, tubulin that wrap around to form the cylinder. Okay, the cylinder is about 25 nanometers wide and it can be several micrometers long. So, so the length uh, varies depending on the type of the cell, um, the stage of the cell you're looking at. So a mitotic cell would have um, longer microtubules uh, than a cell in interface. Um, but they're all, of course, made up of tubulin. Okay, and these are the dimensions of, 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 tu of tubulin. Okay, now um, microtubules are studied uh, for a variety of biochemical roles uh, they typically play. Okay, so they are important, like I said, to maintain uh, cell shape and rigidity. Um, and the slide here says neuron, um, but really microtubules are present in almost every cell of the body. Okay, um, they're crucial for the maintenance of cell shape and rigidity. Uh, they're important for cell division, um, and they um, and they act as um, they form a railroad for the transport of macromolecules across the cell. Um, so if you want to, you know, move a mitochondria, for example, from from a, a part, one part of the cell to another part of the cell, you do it along a microtubule through these uh, what are called motor proteins. Okay, and we'll talk a little bit about motor proteins um, uh, in a second. Uh, but microtubules interact with a variety of biochemical agents. Okay, so it's not just these motor proteins. Um, there are these microtubule associated proteins. Okay, that drive microtubule association with other organelles. Um, so there are the kinesins that we'll discuss in a second, um, but there are other maps um, of microtubule associated proteins such as tau, uh, MAP7, um, double cortin, XMAP215, and other uh, complexes. Okay, um, and these and these maps really are what are what help microtubules change their lengths um, and and maintains a cell shape. Now, not on, not only do um, Microtubules interact with other proteins. They also um, they've also been found to be um, active sites for the binding of drugs. So several drugs we use in chemotherapy, um, such as Taxol, actually bind microtubules to tubulin, and um, you know they, they alter microtubule stability. And and this is actually how how they how they target uh, how how they play their functional role in the cell. So Taxol and Colchicine are the examples of two uh, two drugs that actually target tubulin in microtubules. Okay, now if we go back to um, kinesin, which remember is this is this um, is this motor protein uh, 
that um, that almost walks on top of a microtubule. Okay, so kinesins have been uh, have been used uh, not just by the biology community, but they've also been harnessed by the nanotechnology community as a as a molecular motor is what these they are called. Okay, um, so the idea here is that you can utilize uh, the uh, this movement, this walking like movement of a kinesin on a microtubule. Um, to, to get some, um, to, to, to move not just mitochondria, but anything you might label the kinesin with. So if you want to have a large inorganic molecule that you've labeled the kinesin with outside the cell, you could make the kinesin walk along a microtubule and transport this inorganic cargo. Okay. Um, kinesins are driven by ATP hydrolysis. Okay. And so they function as intracellular actuators that input, that use chemical energy of ATP hydrolysis as input and they output uh, uh, an actual mechanical movement, right? That, so they output the walking action. Okay. Um, dynein is, um, is another uh, analog of kinesin, uh, but, but kinesin moves um, from, the, from the minus end of a microtubule to the plus end of a microtubule, whereas the dynein moves from the plus end to, to the minus end. So, so, they, so if you want to move uh, from the tip of a microtubule to the base of a microtubule, you'd use kinesin. But if you wanted to use, you know, move from the base to the tip, you'd use uh, dynein uh, on a microtubule. Okay. Um, now, like I said, um, they've been uh, the kinesin microtubule interaction has been harnessed. Um, this is quite useful in biology, but it's also been harnessed by uh, those who study nanotechnology. Um, so this is an in vitro um, a, a microscope slide where we can see microtubules floating around randomly on a bed of kinesins. Okay, so they've coated the, the, they have a glass slide, um, or I guess a silicon oxide, um, this, this wafer that has been coated with kinesins in green here. And you can see that the microtubule um, is, is, uh, is moving on top of the bed of kinesins. So one can transport even microtubules uh, outside the cell um, using, this, um, um, using this paradigm. And this has been used um, uh, as, as actuator geometries um, for MEMS devices, okay? Um, so, so that's, that's really the big thrust of, of microtubules. Um, they study not only in, in the biology community, but also for nanotechnology. Um, this is a, is a very nice example of, uh, uh, somebody using a, a tube within a tube. So they're transporting a microtubule inside a larger inorganic tube. Um, um, I think it was aluminum oxide is, is, is what the material was. Yes. The outer tube and the inner tube is a microtubule. Okay, so they managed to get this, this movement to take place um, inside this larger tube. Um, we have um, this geometry that was used um, to create a concentrator device out of a microtubule. So the idea is to look at um, microtubules as, as a MEMS device here. Um, just, uh, you know, outside the biology community uh, uh, for, for nanotechnological applications, uh, like I was mentioning. So this is this is uh, microtubules being used as a as a as a rectifier, uh, basically. Um, of course, one of the big uh, the big advantages of using microtubules, the reason the nanotechnology finds them um, attractive, is because microtubules have large persistence lengths. Okay, uh, the persistence length of a polymer is is a quantity that uh, that um, that measures its bending stiffness. So to say that microtubules have a large persistence length is to say that they are very stiff. And this is an advantage a, a microtubule has um, over DNA. So uh, this is why um, uh, DNA nanotechnology is, is, is viewed almost as secondary when it compares to protein polymer nanotechnology or, or microtubule-based devices, because microtubule-based devices are thought to be stiffer um, uh, than DNA uh, polymers. You, 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 can see, you can see the numbers here. Um, uh, DNA has a persistence length of in the nanometer regime, but microtubules have a persistence length in the millimeter regime. Now, the, uh, the cool thing here really is that when Taxol and other maps and drugs bind to microtubules, they can actually change the persistence length. So they can make a microtubule more bendy or less bendy. And so you can really tune the nanotechnological application of microtubules. Um, dip, you know, so, so say you want the microtubule to be more bendy. And so, so you, you add a little bit of taxol and now the microtubules bend a little more. If you want them to be more stiff, then you can really leave the taxol out. And so this, I'm, I'm telling you this to, to motivate the fact that microtubules are not just important from a cell biological standpoint, but also from a, 
from a from a physics standpoint or from a um, like i said a nanotechnology standpoint okay um now this is a quantum biology uh, session right so wh why would i tell you about this um the thing is microtubules have also been thought of um uh, to to play roles in electronic energy migration okay um they're thought to play ro roles in 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 exciton transfer something that is typically seen in photosynthetic complexes okay and then greg just gave a wonderful talk about introducing that photosynthetic complexes and uh, greg pointed this out um have a large uh, rate constant for energy transfer among them right um they they are very good light absorbers they have high quantum yields um why would somebody um look at a microtubule as 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 almost as a rival to to say chlorophyll or as as a similar complex as chlorophyll um that's really the question right why why would why would uh, microtubules play these 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 alleged quantum roles um well, what makes microtubules special <clears throat> the idea here is that um what makes microtubules special is that they have aromatic amino acids which absorb uv light so 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 remember chlorophyll absorbs light in the visible regime microtubules have these aromatic residues that absorb light in the uv regime okay so they have tryptophan tyrosine and phenylalanine all of which absorb different wavelengths of uv light um there are short distances between these aromatic residues that enable energy transfer such as foster resonance energy transfer that, that greg was mentioning okay um so that makes them similar to chlorophyll but what really makes microtubules unique is the fact that they have a lattice like structure this is what excites the physicists and so really now we're entering the physics realm of, of the talk moving away from the cell biology end of the talk okay microtubules have a long range order they have a lattice and this is a rare um, thing in in biology in 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 the in what's been called the hot wet and noisy environment of cell biology okay it's this long range order um microtubules are also directionally polarized so uh, one end of the microtubule um that's the minus end is morphologically different than the plus end so perhaps there could be some directionality uh, to uh, excitonic energy transfer um right after all a kinesin that i showed you um, has a directional motion right uh, the dynein has the opposite motion um and so of course really the question is uh, could a microtubule be used for electronic ends uh, could a microtubule um serve as an electronic device uh, there have been um there have been these ideas um uh positing that um this reactive oxygen species that release light um inside the cell um could be used by tubulin dimers and enable some kind of cascade of energy transfer event uh, in a microtubule uh, really harnessing the lattice like structure of of, of these of these polymers right um so does this sort of thing happen is it even viable um you know you can make these models but but would it would it actually take place um this is um this is really the the question and you know and and so there there are these models by stuart hameroff uh, that show that there could be computing inside the cell that takes place so the idea here is that you'd utilize this excitonic energy transfer um you'd have a map or a drug that binds to a microtubule and the moment it binds it kicks off a cascade of of uh, of energy transfer events and because the uh, microtubule has a lattice like structure um you could have um different maps binding at different times different drugs interacting in different sites um which would release different uh, patterns in in the microtubule lattice patterns of excitons that is allowing for some kind of biophotonic computing that takes place um uh, either inside the cell or outside it now bear in mind that these are very um these are very futuristic um and 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 sometimes controversial ideas right and so um and so really um when i began my experiments um which is what i'm going to talk a little bit about now uh, the idea was to um, was to perform some very solid uh, basic experiments microtubule excitons and really evaluate um what the fuss was all about could microtubules actually act as carriers for excitons could electronic energy migrate um along microtubules uh, in a manner that is similar to chlorophyll right and so tryptophan uh, fluorescence um tryptophan has the highest quantum yield among the three uh, 
fluorophores, tryptophan, tyrosine, phenylalanine. And I decided to use tryptophan fluorescence to study uh, tubulin photonics. Right. So the, for the first experiment we did uh, was to excite microtubules across a variety of, of wavelengths and see where they fluoresced. Right. So you can see that, that, that when I excite um, microtubules at, at 280 nanometers, I get an output at about, um, at about 300 to 350 nanometers. Okay, so this is consistent with tryptophan uh, being present in, in the tubulin polymer. Um, and this is tryptophan fluorescence. Um, now we have this external fluorophore called AMCA. Uh, it's a coumarin derivative. And AMCA absorbs light at 350 nanometers. Okay, um, so it can absorb light that the tryptophan emits. And it can release this light at uh, 450 nanometers. Okay. So the next thing we did was we labeled um, AMCA to, uh, to microtubules. And of course, we got, we got two fluorescent signatures. We got, the, we got the tryptophan signature in the microtubules that was already there. And the AMCA signature um, that, uh, that came from the, from the labeling of the microtubules to AMCA. But not only that, we got a third signal. You see, we got what's called a cross peak. And this is consistent with energy transfer, with electronic energy transfer between the AMCA and the tryptophan. Okay, so the concept here is um, that um, that uh, tubulin uh, emits light at about uh, three to 300, 350 nanometers. Um, remember, this is the emission that you saw here from tryptophan, and that um, AMCA absorbs this emission, right? Um, and so, uh, and and Greg uh, spoke at great length about the spectral overlap uh, integral. And the idea here is that Forster resonance energy transfer is, is dependent on, on the spectral overlap between the, um, the emission of tubulin tryptophans and the absorption of AMCA that have been labeled to them. Right? Uh, now, FRET, uh, as, Greg, uh, as Greg mentioned, is a, is a multivariate uh, uh, process. Right? So here we can see that it depends uh, dramatically on the distance between the fluorophores, R to the 6. So that now in this context, that would mean the distance in between the AMCA and the tryptophan is crucial. But not only does it depend on the distance, it also depends on the refractive index of the medium. So that's n to the four. Uh, the, the orientation that Greg spoke about, the kappa squared, and of course, the all important quantum yield uh, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, the, of the donor complex, uh, really. Okay. And this is the spectral overlap uh, integral term. So this is FRET. Uh, K describes the number of energy transfer events you have per second. So this is a rate constant. <coughs> OK. Um, so Foster resonance energy transfer can be used to model um, uh, electronic energy transfer between tryptophan and AMCA. OK. And to study this, I used something called time-correlated single photon counting. OK. So I did fluorescence lifetimes is the concept. Uh, we had a diode that inputted light at 305 nanometers. This is our microtubule solution. Um, 305 nanometers light excites tryptophans. Uh, and we detected their emission at 335 nanometers. Uh, the time difference between the excitation and the emission can be plotted on a histogram, which can then be fit to a variety of exponentials. Tryptophan is well known to have two exponentials. Uh, and these exponentials can give you a lifetime of the, of the, of the process. Uh, we fit them to three exponentials, uh, accounting for scattering as well. So the fits you get out of this, in simple terms, can tell you the tryptophan fluorescence lifetimes uh, in, a, in a microtubule. Okay, and so and so right. The experiment that I did was I mixed some um, AMCA labeled tubulin with some unlabeled tubulin. Okay, and so, you know one can create a mixture, a cocktail of the two, and polymerize microtubules from that. And depending on the ratio of fully labeled tubulin to unlabeled tubulin, you can get a spectrum of, um, of labeling ratios, basically. So if you have only labeled tubulin, you can, you can end up with a labeling ratio of one is to one, meaning every single uh, tubulin inside the microtubule is labeled with AMCA. You can also end up, you can also mix, uh, you know, one half of this and one half of this, and then you'll end up with a ratio, an equal ratio of labeled and unlabeled um, tubulins in a microtubule. And then you can titrate, right? So you can you can um, you can have a one in seven where only a one out of seven dimers is labeled with AMCA. And and really the, the idea here is that um, the tryptophan lifetime without AMCA will be long, but the moment you add AMCA, um, the tryptophan lifetime will drop. 
um, because of FRET, right? Because of foster residence energy transfer. So um, we went ahead, polymerized some microtubules. Uh, this is a TEM image of, uh, of, of, of microtubules that I had. And we went ahead and we measured their fluorescence lifetimes. You can see that as the concentration of AMCA uh, was increased, uh, the, the lifetime appears to reduce. So great, that, that makes sense. Uh, we quantified this, um, we fit this to a bunch of exponentials, uh, and we produced an average weighted lifetime. Now you can see that the average weighted lifetime of tubulin, which is the unpolymerized form, red line, is different than the microtubules, which is the black line. Okay, And the dashed lines here represent the unlabeled forms of both tubulin and microtubules. So you can clearly tell that something is different between the microtubules and the tubulin. Okay. So the monomer uh, differs from the polymer, uh, even from a photophysical standpoint, right? Um, of course, this is a function of, of AMCA concentrations, okay? Um, could this indicate some kind of electronic energy migration? Could this indicate some kind of intertryptophan hopping in a microtubule? That's the question, right? Now, those in the solar cell community use uh, uh, something called a Stern-Volmer analysis to determine diffusion lengths of, of excitons, okay? Um, I'm avoiding using the word exciton um, uh, because as, as Professor Douglas Brass uh, pointed out, um, an exciton is, you know, officially is, is, is a bound electron hole pair, whereas over here, uh, we just have a tryptophan energy migration, right? So I'm, I'm gonna be calling these photo excitation diffusion lengths and not exciton or diffusion lengths, okay? Um, so one can use these fluorescence lifetimes to extract a rate constant of energy transfer using the Stern-Volmer analysis, okay? So you fit, you, you, you use this equation, uh, you fit it, um, and you, you, get, um, you, you get a rate constant out of it, of energy transfer. You can see that the rate constant of energy transfer is, um, is almost three times higher in a microtubule, okay? Indicating that there are more pathways available in a microtubule. One can use this rate constant to, to extract a diffusion coefficient of the photo excitation migration. So this is the area uh, uh, that, the, 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 ex the photo excitation explores on a microtubule. And you can see that the area that, that the photo excitation ex explores on a microtubule is dramatically larger uh, as compared to a tubulin dimer. From the diffusion coefficient, um, one can extract a diffusion length. And you can see that uh, the diffusion length uh, for photo excitation migration is about six and a half nanometers for a microtubule, but only four nanometers for a tubulin dimer. Okay, so there's a difference between the microtubule and the tubulin in terms of uh, electronic energy migration as measured by the photo excitation diffusion. Okay, and so tryptophan photo excitation diffusion in a microtubule is about 6.6 .6 nanometers. So, so my experiments said. Um, now, of course, um, we decided to add some maps and drugs to the system. Uh, remember me telling you that uh, maps and drugs can change the stiffness of a microtubule? That they can change the persistence length of a microtubule? The idea was to see whether, whether these agents can also alter um, their photophysical properties. So in addition to, to changing their mechanical properties, uh, can these agents also alter uh, the electronic energy migration? All right, that's, that's the question you're asking here. Now, the problem with adding a map to the solution, and I did this, is that many maps... Maps, remember, are microtubule-associated proteins. Many maps also have tryptophan in them. And this tryptophan will fluoresce, right? So I ended up, I ended up convoluting the tryptophan fluorescence from the maps with those of the tryptophans inside the microtubules. Okay. And so um, instead of using maps, we decided to use some anesthetics um, that we know that we know uh, knew from molecular dynamic simulations bound to microtubules. Okay. So we decided to explore atomidate. Uh, and isoflurane, which are two very different anesthetics um, with different binding sites on the, on the tubulin dimer. And we decided to see how these biochemical agents alter uh, exciton migration. Okay, so once, ahead, once again, uh, we went ahead, we plotted tryptophan fluorescence lifetimes, um, measured uh, you know, at the average weighted lifetime. Um, you, you can see that uh, the differences appear to be small, um, at, at least when the, concent the AMCA concentrations are low. Um, in the unlabeled form, uh, there are almost no differences, um, right? Uh, uh, these, these, these differences are insignificant. But as I increase the concentration of AMCA, you can see that the purple and green lines begin to deviate from the black lines, okay? 
uh, when I when I um, when I uh, when I perform the Stern Volmer an analysis for uh, for a tomidate and isoflurane, um, and I and I get the quenching rate constants, uh, I see that there are actually uh, significant differences between microtubules with 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 anesthetics added and and without anesthetics added, right? Um, the the rate of quenching seems to reduce uh, when anesthetics are present in a microtubule. Um, and so for the diffusion length, a uh, diffusion coefficient. Uh, and the diffusion length. And this really is, is an exciting result because it indicates that anesthetics, at least atomidate and isoflurane, reduce um, exciton energy transfer in a microtubule, right? Um, so atomidate and isoflurane decrease photo excitation uh, migration in a, in, a, in a microtubule. Um, now, remember, um, I explained, um, I explained, um, tryptophan and AMCA interactions through FRET, uh, right? So I went ahead and I contacted my colleague, Alfie Benny, and he performed some simulations um, using, the, and, and, and you guys know about this from Greg's lecture just now. Uh, he used um, the, the Coulombic coupling, uh, which is, you know, the V a parameter here that incorporates the, the dipole uh, interactions between the tryptophans. Um, he incorporated the spectral overlap integral uh, for homo energy transfer between tryptophans and he used from his golden rule. And he ended up um, simulating a, a, a electronic energy migration inside a microtubule, but he could only account for um, a, a migration distance or diffusion length of 1.6 to 1.7 nanometers. Remember, my experimentally determined diffusion lengths are about six and a half to seven nanometers. So these values are dramatically smaller than those predicted. Uh, so than those I experimentally see, sorry, right? And so Foster resonance energy transfer does not sufficiently explain our uh, experimental results. Okay, um, possible reasons for this, um, Greg did explore. Uh, one of them is, is the point dipole approximations. Uh, so when two tryptophans are, are so close to each other, um, you know, they're, uh, they, they basically can't be assumed to be point dipoles uh, because they they, 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 there is, um, there is uh, atomic, there is uh, orbital overlap that takes place. Uh, basically, uh, you could also have um, electronic energy migration. Uh, so, so, sorry, electron uh, transfer that takes place as a result. Um, so that's that's reasons one and three. Uh, reason number two is that the protein refractive index uh, that was used for the simulation actually changes depending on on where you are in the protein. So, a tryptophan exposed to the solvent has a different refractive index than a tryptophan exposed um, than a tryptophan you know deep inside the protein matrix. So this is, um, um, these are some reasons why we think foster resonance energy transfer may not sufficiently explain our results. Um, and so the, really the takeaways here are uh, that microtubules are unexpectedly efficient like harvesting complexes and that dominated and isoflurane can um, reduce uh, photo excitation diffusion lengths, tailoring uh, electronic energy migration in a microtubule. Um, uh, our work has just been published in this journal ACS Central Science. And uh, we, we actually were fortunate enough to make it to the cover of, 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 th of this month's issue. Um, so, so with this, I, uh, I, I thank you for your attention and um, let me know if you have uh, any questions. Oh, thank you for that, Eric. Uh, oh, thanks. So I think I idea of before. what uh, microtubules are now and, and why they might be important. Um, I think I think short. We, I'll give people a bit of time to, uh, to think about what they want to ask. Um, oh. I'm going to, and I'll ask you a question. Um, when you talked about the energy transfer through microtubules, is that something that you think happens in biology or is this something that you're interested in sort of using biological structures but for a sort of technology point of view so far it's the second option that you gave right okay. because i mean the question susanna is where would you get uv light in the cell from right sure you know one thing is this is the cell was full of uv light and okay, then maybe you could excite you know there could be this tryptophan to tryptophan energy transfer but given that there's no uv light in the cell i don't see a way 
Um, so it was worth waiting a little bit of time for a question. So we have one from Ravi, which is, um, did you titrate the anesthetics as well? Yes, in an experiment, I, I increased the concentration of anesthetics by five times, and I got I got similar results, indicating that uh, that that the, yes, uh, uh, so I did. Now I didn't now I didn't titrate them over several different concentrations, and maybe that is a, that is a cool experiment to do. Uh, but definitely, I wanted to see if this was this was in fact just being seen at one concentration of anesthetics, and and that wasn't true. Um, Professor Brash has raised his hand. Um, so Sorry, a, you've, got a, a you've got a follow up on that question. So I'll give you the follow up oh. first, and then we'll come to Douglas. So, so, uh, so why so, only fifty micromolar? Uh, hmm. The yes. So the, the follow up answer is um, one wants to inundate uh, the microtubules with an anesthetics at this point. So you add anesthetics in excess, and so fifty micromolar is is a large concentration to to have, um, and this is why this is why I chose uh, fifty micromolar. Thank you. Um, all right, um, Douglas, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Yeah, hi. So as far as moving into biology, if what you're worrying about is having a, a internal source of ultraviolet light, um, you don't really need the ultraviolet light, right? You just need that level of energy? Yes, yes. Oh, I, I... Okay, so good. So I can give you that. Um, so we stumbled across, and I just wrote a review on that you can find if you Google it, that you can get that level of energy from chemical excitation into, into triplet states at least. And it's fairly common. Um, it's, it takes five or 10 minutes to explain, so I won't take people's time. But basically, if you have uh, free radicals around either induced by light or by inflammation or something, it can react with molecules like melanin or neurotransmitters for that matter. And oh. um, yeah, um, so that's also that's new. It, yeah, that's, it's in the last what, month or so yeah. also published. So uh, so that will give you your, um, at least you have a shot at finding some uh, UV-like, UVB-like energies uh, in the cell in the dark. Right. Uh, can you point me to this review paper? Uh, you, you, yeah. Are you an author? Uh, yeah. So if you go if you go to PubMed and look up me, I think you'll find both of them. Um, what I can do is shoot you an email, um, and uh, so I don't waste people's time. But well, I'll send you the PDFs. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, Right, you've got a whole bunch more questions in the Q and A. Would you like me to read them out, or I don't know if you can um, see them already? I can, I can see them. So, uh, so uh, yeah. Ravinam asks, um, uh, there are other mechanisms of tryptophan quenching as well. Uh, did you take those into account? Um, a great question. Um, there are other mechanisms of tryptophan quenching. Uh, vibrational quenching is is the first is the first option. The thing is, Raviram, um, when you add anesthetics to the same system, and there's a difference in the lifetime with anesthetics and without anesthetics. One presumes that um, the, the, that's a uh, the same mechanisms of quenching would be available to both uh, to, to microtubules where the anesthetics were present and microtubules where the anesthetics were absent. Given that the tryptophan lifetime in the unlabeled microtubules was exactly the same, um, that that to me indicates that the that the that the anesthetics uh, were the reason why I was getting a, a change in the in the in the photo excitation diffusion length. If you're looking at the FRET equation and you want me to point at a parameter, you know, what, what parameter is it that, uh, that anesthetics alter? It's the N parameter, it's the refractive index. You see, when a molecule binds on top of a microtubule, it changes the local uh, refractive index around a tryptophan. So my hunch is that um, it's a refractive index effect that, that, the, that we're seeing with the anesthetics. Okay, um, uh, Harshwardhan Bhatkar asks, uh, slide 23, 24, can any other labeling um, would also change the diffusion length just because it reduces available hopping sites? Um, would you? I'm not sure I understand the question, Harshwardhan. Um, I think maybe what he's saying is if you bind other things onto or microtubules with that that reduces the number of sites that the, the excitation can hop onto. So would that also 
change your overall diffusion length, even if that uh, thing that's found isn't involved in the transfer process. Oh, I see. I see. Yeah, that's that, that's a that's a great question. Okay, so instead of instead of AMCA, say I had some other fluorophore, uh, you know, would it would it change the diffusion length? Uh, the, the short answer is no. This is diffusion between tryptophans. Remember, and tryptophans are locked in inside inside the microtubule lattice. So uh, we wouldn't really see a difference. However, remember this is this is what I predict. I still think it would be exciting to actually do the do the experiment you talk of, and instead of labeling it with uh, with AMCA, label it with another fluorophore, and just see what you get for a diffusion length. Um, are there any other uh, questions? Uh, okay. Uh, somebody has a message. In. Okay. Thanks, Raviram. Thanks, Sashwadhan. Yeah, you have got one more. Uh, they haven't wanted to put their name, but someone has asked, when you refer to hopping, are you referring to electron hopping or some other type of hopping? And if it is electron hopping, is there evidence that the electrons are moving or just the fret energy? It is not electron hopping. It is electronic energy hopping. So it is just fret energy. But then it, as it turned out, fret energy wasn't enough to explain my results, right? So it's, it's electronic energy migration is what I'm measuring, uh, not explainable through just fret. Is 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 the answer? Thank you. All right. Um, we're a little bit ahead of schedule. Um, unless there are any more questions, um, I suggest that maybe we take a sort of ten minute recovery break, and people can go and uh, get a drink, go to the toilet, that kind of thing. Um, our third lecture is pre-recorded, so um, we can start that really whenever we want. And I, I suggest maybe we reconvene at 10 to, uh, to hear that final lecture. So you can, uh, you, you can hang around on the call or you can <laughs> go away and rejoin in 10 minutes. And we'll see you then. Thank you once again, Ara.
All right, so hopefully everyone's feeling uh, a little bit more refreshed and ready to hear uh, one more lecture. Um, so our final lecture of the day is going to be about um, environmentally assisted energy transfer in biological systems. Um, and it's going to be given to us by Dr. Charlie Nation, who is uh, at University College London in the UK. And um, unfortunately, he wasn't able to be with us uh, exactly at this time. So he's recorded his lecture uh, ahead of time for us. And hopefully I'm <laughs> going to share this with you uh, on, a, on a shared screen. Uh, so I think that once I uh, start playing this, I'm not actually going to be able to to see the Zoom window, so maybe someone can just give me a shout if this ends up uh, not working, either with the video or with the sound. I'll give you feedback. Great, thank you. <laughs> I'll just uh, mute myself. Hello, uh, my name's Charlie Nation, and we're talking today right, for the pre-GRC conference. Uh, talking about environmentally assisted energy transfer in biological systems. Uh, so I'd first like to thank the organisers of the pre-GRC conference. I think this is a really great initiative for such a, a diverse field where uh, we can all learn a little bit about what each other's doing because there's so many different disciplines um, uh, in, in quantum biology. I think this is a yeah, really great initiative. So uh, thank you for uh, organising this. Um, so yes, I'm going to be talking today from a theoretical physicist's perspective and, and I will first discuss some of the core fingerprints of quantum systems that we expect to be able to potentially observe in quantum biology um, and I'll then talk about what is, at least in the day-to-day -day of the theorist, uh, the core challenge of quantum biology which is the openness of the quantum systems. So what I mean by this is the interaction with the environment uh, and how this environment can be a very complicated uh, system in and of itself and the interaction with the, syst the, the system, which is the degrees of freedom of interest, uh, can provide some complicated mechanisms. Um, so I'll just give a very brief overview of open quantum systems. So I know you're gonna have a more uh, substantial lecture uh, on an introduction to this uh, tomorrow so I won't go into much detail but just enough to describe what we mean by the environment and, and how a physicist treats it. Um, so then I'll talk about some core mechanisms uh, behind environmentally enhanced transport so how the openness of the quantum system can uh, quite counterintuitively enable or, or enhance this, the transport properties uh, of the quantum system and I'll talk about how uh, quantum coherence is manifest in this in some systems or uh, not in others. Um, and so this will be some, some very, very simple examples that aren't uh, of direct biological rev relevance immediately, uh, though I will then move on to discuss some examples in realistic systems, in this case uh, the feather matthews olsen complex in, of a photosynthetic biomolecule. Um, so these examples will give some evidence, at least uh, both from theory and experiment, that indeed we have, uh, we can see examples of these simple mechanisms that I'll describe for environmentally enhanced transport. 
So to begin, the first uh, key fingerprint that we aim to look for of, of quantumness in a biological system is the, the delocalization of excitations. So what we mean by this is that in a, in a classical system, if we have a single excitation on site, on some sites, say, that are, are local areas that can, can host an excitation, uh, in a classical system we would expect these, uh, these excitations to remain fully localized. Uh, whereas in a, in a quantum system, what we, we can see uh, excitations that, that delocalize over the sites. Uh, so this means that a single excitation, so there's only one excitation present, and each site can only host one excitation, and it's a discrete one, so it can host a single excitation or no excitations, yet still this excitation can be delocalized between the sites. So this uh, phenomena is intimately linked with a concept that we call coherence. And coherence is fundamentally uh, correlations in some probabilistic theory that cannot exist in a, in a classical probability theory. So by a, a classical probability theory, I mean uh, something that looks a bit like this, where we have the state of our system uh, represented as the sum of two probabilities. So the, the first is a probability that the, the, the excitation is hosted on site one, and the second is that it's hosted on site three. So this would be the case if we knew that the excitation is hosted on one of these sites. But let's say we didn't know if there was an excitation at all. Well, we would have a third probability uh, that there was no excitation. But all of these probabilities would still sum to one so that we have a probability theory that makes sense. Um, so this is the, the most general description that we can have of a classical uh, probabilistic state. On the other hand, with a, with a quantum state, we have this extra term, and this extra term is called the coherence. And this can be manifested uh, physically in a bunch of possible ways, uh, for example, in interference effects, you can see oscillations due to it. Um, but fundamentally, it is an additional term in the probability theory that cannot exist classically. It's, these, it's additional correlations between these probabilities. Um, and we'll see that when an environment is introduced that uh, we often observe what's called decoherence, which is where this coherence term rapidly decays to zero and the state becomes more classical in some sense. So just to introduce some, some notation, uh, we will describe this general quantum state that I've written at the bottom here in terms of what's called a density matrix which is exactly those contributions. So we have row one, one here, which is, uh, and the position in this matrix is given by this, what's called Dirac notation. So the one, one with the angle brackets facing each other is simply the one, one site in this matrix here. Uh, two, one gives an off diagonal and, and uh, the rest follows. Uh, so we have these diagonal components, row one, one and row two, two are the, the population. So these are the the classical probabilities that there is a uh, an excitation on site one or site two, and the the um, the off diagonal here gives the coherences between these sites, and you can see that these there's two numbers, but they're related to each other by a complex conjugate. Um, so. Often with a, with a quantum state comes a, a description of the system itself, and the system itself can be described by what's called a Hamiltonian, uh, and this describes the, the energies on, on each site, so E1 and E2, and V is the coupling between these sites. So this is the, the most general description of a quantum system. So. For such a, a two-site quantum system, um, there are some uh, the primitive excitations of this system are called excitons, and these are the the eigenstates of this Hamiltonian, and they they are special states in the sense that, in the absence of an environment, 
the exotonic states or these uh, the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian are constant in time uh, because they, they diagonalize this Hamiltonian. Um, and there are a couple of limits that we can look at this Hamiltonian for that will give us some intuition on, on when it is delocalized and when it is a, a localized system. So the two important parameters of interest are the difference between these site energies, E1 minus E2, or the absolute value of this, and this coupling strength V. So depending on how these two are related, we have localization of exotons or delocalization of exotons. So in the case where V is very small, the exotons are essentially localized on sites. Okay, so we have exoton 1 here and exoton 2, and they're essentially localized on the respective site. In the other limit, when V is much greater than this energy gap, we have that the coupling enables the bridging of this energy gap very easily. So that's a, a kind of intuitive uh, concept that you might uh, find helpful. Um, this, when this uh, coupling allows for the bridging of this energy gap, you get very delocalized exot exotons. Um, and what we'll see is that this the environment actually has a, has a localizing effect on excitation, which is another aspect where the environment acts to more to, to, uh, to influence the system towards a classical sort of uh, description typically. So I'm going <laughs> to stress that that's a, a tip for a typical environment. Um, so now just a brief description of, of why we have to come from an open quantum systems perspective and what I mean by that. So uh, in general we can describe the evolution of a quantum state, uh, psi, which is the uh, uh, a single realization of a quantum state, let's say, um, by a Hamiltonian, and this would be completely valid for a closed quantum system, and we can simply solve this. So it, these these equations don't really matter. But the the key feature is that this is the Schrödinger equation, and we can solve the Schrödinger equation if we know the Hamiltonian. Um, so, for example, if it's con constant in time, we just have an exponent here, uh, and this would be a very this is a very useful way of finding the, the time evolution of some quantum state. Um, however, this is a completely unfeasible approach when this system is of a, a biological size, where this because this Hamiltonian as a matrix grows exponentially as you increase the system size. So even for just describing qubits or bunches of two-level systems, you very, very quickly reach uh, a size of the system that is just impossible to even write down this Hamiltonian or, or load it into a computer. So um, we need to come up with approximation methods. Uh, and to do this, we split up our system into the system and a bath or an environment. Uh, so those terms are used uh, often uh, is the same thing. Um, and the system is the degrees of freedom that we particularly care about. Uh, so that's where our observables live. Uh, so for example, for a photosynthetic complex, this is the, the sites, the whether or which site is excited, which exciton is excited. So these are the same um, degrees of freedom. Uh, and the environmental degrees of freedom are averaged over, they're traced out or they're, they're um, discarded in a manner that allows us to capture the influence of the environment on the system, but without necessarily tracking the entire evolution of the, of the environment. Um, so this, uh, I, in simpler cases, for example, can lead us to a, a master equation or a generalized master equation that simply describes the evolution of the system density matrix in what's called the, a, a coherent part, which is something that's, uh, that, that depends on the system Hamiltonian or some effective system Hamiltonian and then some dissipative contribution or some environmental contribution that is often incoherent. So there's no coherence is uh, often usually uh, implied or, or enforced by this uh, environmental term. Um, so this is 
uh, what's called a master equation, and it's a, a simple case of, a, of an environmental contribution. So now we want to describe how transport can occur in a quantum system, and this, this two-level example will, will uh, provide us with some intuition here as well. So the simple is, is the simplest example of transport in a quantum system. So if we excite our site one that has energy here, E1, uh, we can ask the question of quantum transport of, of what's the likelihood and the, the rate at which this excitation will be transported from site one to site two. And we can see in the Hamiltonian already that the coupling V is what couples these two things. Okay, so we might expect uh, V to have a, a core role here, uh, and then that the and we saw that that this this energy gap as well we might expect to have a key role. So this model uh, relates um, slightly to a photosynthetic model in the sense that these photosynthetic Frankel exoton models uh, are sums of many sites with couplings between these sites. And this is a, a very simplified two site description of these Frankel exoton models. Uh, so uh, we also need to include our environment, which generally is given by what's called a spectral density, though I won't be uh, which is what's pictured here, though I won't be discussing the details of, uh, of spectral densities. The core aspect you can think of here is that there are, in general, well, no, in, in this case, what we would expect is two contributions to the environment. The first being optical, which let's, uh, describes the excitation of uh, from the ground state to this first excited state, what's called a manifold or a subspace of single excitations, so site one and site two. So the optical environment might excite this by some photon uh, coming along, and then at some later time, uh, they, it would de-excite and the excitation would uh, be uh, decay would decay into the optical environment. Um, so this typically happens uh, in the systems of interest, these photosynthetic molecules over about a nanosecond or so. Um, but what's far more important for the for the description of quantum transport is the much shorter time scales, which is those time scales over which vibrational environments act, which is on the few picoseconds. Uh, so if we just want to describe the early time transport over a few picoseconds, we have this vast separation of time scales. So we can essentially ignore the optical environment and just assume some initial excitation at some time. So we only describe now the, the vibrational in environment of this system. And this is described by local couplings to these sites. So this is this angle bracket ii term here. Uh, so we have a sum of the, over the uh, sites for i equals one and two, uh, to have these local couplings. And then this, this these B dagger Bs are essentially a, a, this, a sum of harmonic oscillators. So we have many possible frequencies that the, the vibrational environment can host. And each site is coupled to those frequencies uh, by some coupling strength G. This is in general, as I said, characterized by spectral density, but we won't go into too much detail about that. Um, so there are two core uh, limits of these environments. That uh, So the first is where we have a, a large separation of, of time scales between what's the, this memory time or the correlation time of an environment and the, the system time scale. So this is how quickly oscillations within the system itself occur. And when there's this, when there's a large separation between these time scales, we can uh, describe the environment itself as Markovian, which means it uh, we essentially can describe simple dissipative or decohering processes that uh, are not too numerically expensive. Um, it becomes much more difficult when we have the this memory time acting over time scales that are similar to the system. Uh, because in this case we have to uh, track so, 
at least some of the degrees of freedom of the environment as well, so because there's there's feedback uh, from the environment back to the system, depending on earlier states of the system. So we it's a it's a much more complicated process when when we don't have this separation of time scales. So today. Uh, of what I'll discuss is two mechanisms of environmentally enhanced transfer and one will be from each type let's say one will be a purely Markovian type and the other will rely on the non-Markovianity of the environment but we will cheat a little bit in describing this non-Markovianity um, to elucidate the core mechanism uh, so the fully Markovian model uh, says that uh, describes the vibrational environment as simply de uh, some, some decoherence or dephasing in particular over uh, on these sites and effectively what this describes it as is some uncertainty in the energy of the site that acts over time so there's what's sometimes called dynamical disorder on the site energies and this is completely dictated by this uh, strength of environmental coupling or this decay rate gamma um, and for those of you who've studied a little bit of open quantum systems, this is going to be modelled by a, a Lindblad or a, a type uh, dissipator with the jump operator that's just the on-site uh, projector. So um, it's a very simple model of an environmental dephasing on these sites. Uh, and there are three core limits of, of this sort of model. The first is where we have very weak coupling to the environment and this gamma is very small. Um, and this uh, energy or the site energy uncertainty is very small and there is almost no overlap here between these sites or between the excitons. Um, so in this limit we would expect <clears throat> these simply to decay to their equilibrium value which is always guaranteed to be for this very simple model. It's, guaranteed to have half the population here and half the population here at very, very long times. But we would expect this now to be determined almost entirely by this, this rate gamma, uh, where there's very little overlap between these two sites. In the intermediate regime, we can see that there's uh, a substantial part of this, uh, of the energy landscape of each of these sites actually overlaps. Uh, so it's this, this regime where we can think of the, this energy gap being easiest to bridge because as it fluctuates in time, there's, there's a resonance quite often. So we, we might intuitively expect here that um, the transfer between these states can be uh, sped up due to the fact that sometimes the disorder introduces the ability for uh, these sites to cross over and, and be on resonance with each other. Uh, and the third limit is where this disorder is so large that even though it, it um, for most of this disorder does overlap, as you select, uh, as the disorder randomly chooses some energies, they almost never overlap. So this uh, given times we might have an energy here and an energy here and up here and down here. And, the, the overlap between these is, is very, very small, simply because of the very, very large amount of disorder in these systems. So you can see, for example, here, um, uh, three values chosen to be weak, intermediate, and strong. And this is, I'd say, not particularly fine-tuned. If I fine-tuned this, we could see the intermediate coupling even faster. But I just uh, chose a few values that are of, of more relevance. Um, so the weak coupling here, we see a very, very uh, small, uh, slow decay and a very, very slow growth of uh, the, the second uh, site population. So these are site populations plotted where I've initialized the system in site one and we can see the growth of the population of site two is much faster for the intermediate coupling. And you can see that there's some very, very fast oscillations especially in the weak coupling case, you mean you can't even see these dashes really. Um, and this is the effect of the, the coherent oscillations between the sites um, caused by this direct coupling V that causes some very small oscillations. Um, so we can see here that the, 
directly that the the intermediate coupling case we have this enhanced transport rate of the, of the system. Um, it's also interesting that we can see the the strong coupling regime can also be understood as what's called the the quantum Zeno effect, where what the environment does is has has a a, a possible description in terms of a, a repeated measurement on the quantum state. And for very, very strong couplings, this measurement uh, occurs uh, repeatedly on a very short time scales and actually freezes the motion of the, of the state. Um, so what we see here is the, the exotonic coherences and the decay of this coherence. Um, so you can see this is actually decoheres much faster for the intermediate coupling case. And this tells us that this environmentally enhanced transport mechanism is not uh, quantum in the sense that the environment does not act on the system in a quantum coherent way. It is a very incoherent mechanism. Um, though, interestingly, in the strong case, we have this, as, as I said before, this freezing of the quantum state. Uh, so we have a much slower uh, decoherence rate, whereas in the, other, in the intermediate and weak coupling case, this decoherence rate is, is quite fast and it increases uh, with coupling up to the Zeno regime. Um, so this uh, paper here by, by Chin showed, uh, by uh, Alex Chin showed a, um, an example of this in a model of LH2. Uh, so this is the transfer rate between the B800 and B850 bands um, as a function of the noise strength. So this is the essentially our, our gamma. Um, and saw th this uh, exact thing over a very wide range of, of coupling strengths. So you see for, for a few orders of magnitude, we have that the transfer rate simply increases with with the the noise or the environmental coupling and it takes some some very high coupling strengths before this Zeno regime kicks in and we see uh, a decrease here so this this optimum regime is, is quite a strong coupling um, so I said before that it's a, an incoherent environmental mechanism but this doesn't mean that uh, that the delocalization or, or quantum coherence between these sites is not relevant for the for the transport. So we can see here these these are two cases within this uh, intermediate regime somewhere, um, and chosen for two different values of the coupling strength. What we see is uh, as this coupling strength between the two sites, so this coherent coupling strength increases we see a, a faster transport and these fast oscillations here are again indicative of this of this direct coupling V um, and also we see this exotonic coherence is larger for this this case V here though the decay rate is the same because the decay rate is what's influenced by the environment so even though the environmental enhancement is an incoherent mechanism the way that the system can utilize its its environment is dictated essentially by its own internal coherent mechanisms um, so even a completely incoherent environmental effect uh, can have a coherent substance to it in, in, in let's say um, this can be important roles of coherence even for a completely incoherent environment. So now I'll, I will discuss the non-Markovian aspect of the environment. And this, as I said, I'll, I'll cheat a little bit by including uh, these environmental modes somewhat phenomenologically. Um, and we'll ask how can discrete environmental modes actually aid in transport. So what I mean by these discrete modes uh, is that we'll have, uh, instead of simple sites, uh, we, we will now have some levels of vibrational motion. So we have, th and this some way will emulate 
a non-Markovian aspect to the environment by phenomenologically absorbing this uh, the non-Markovian aspect of the environment into the system itself and just describing our sites in terms of um, a uh, coherent environmental mode. Um, so, but we will also keep the same environment environmental role that we had before. So this uh, this dephasing aspect or this Lenblad term we will we'll, we'll keep. Uh, so what this this looks like is that our Hamiltonian now we just take out of the environment two particular frequencies and a particular coupling strength for these frequencies. Um, so these frequencies themselves are quite important and we'll see uh, that the, the resonance of these frequencies is, is a very important factor in, in how these modes can enhance environmental transport. Um, so we'll see, and we'll note this energy gap here, uh, which is omega v, uh, will have some resonance condition uh, where if it is similar to the exciton energy gap, then um, we might expect to see increased transfer, uh, and there's a there will be a better um, plot for that later. Uh, so what's also going to be particularly important is an idea of, of collective vibrational modes. So at the moment we have a, a description in terms of some site 1 that, that has a vibrational mode and some site 2 that has another vibrational mode and these can be discrete vibrational levels, right? So you can have a no vibration, a single vibration. Um, and these independent modes together, the sum of these modes, can be re-described in terms of the sum of their collective modes. So what the collective modes are, essentially, I've tried to, to draw them here, but they're uh, a relative displacement mode, which is like it oscillating like this, and a center of mass mode, which is like it oscillating like this. Right, so uh, described with these two modes, it's called a, a basis transformation between these two modes, we can see that the relative displacement mode, so the one like this, actually acts to couple the excitons together of this system. So as I said before, the excitons uh, are constant in time without uh, environmental description. Well, these modes in particular act as to, to coherently couple the excitons of the of the uh, electronic system together. Um, and this theta is what's called the mixing angle, or it's essentially the uh, the um, a measure of the delocalization of the system. Okay, so. Um, this sine theta term increases with as delocalization increases for, for, for small amounts of delocalization. Um, and so crucially, there's a, there's a coupling term that directly couples the excitons uh, as a role that's, that's, uh, that's influenced by these collective vibrations. So in practice, what we see uh, is again, plotting these site populations now for different uh, vibrational frequencies. Uh, what we have is this middle one in yellow is when the, the vibrational frequency is, is close to the resonance between the exciton energy gap. Uh, and this 800 and 1300, the blue and green, are uh, further away from this energy gap. We indeed still see uh, uh, a enhancement uh, this far away, but crucially, very close to resonance, we see that not only is the the rate sped up, but the probability that we get from site one to site two uh, increases. So there's uh, a, a very large enhance enhancement in, in transport by the role of this coherent vibrational mode. So here we have a, a diagram of, of the mechanism again of, of the of the resonance. So the the resonance occurs when the exciton two plus a single relative displacement mode vibration is similar to the energy of exciton one. So this this allows this this bridge between exciton one and two to be crossed without uh, a large change in the energy. Um, so 
this model was studied in this in this paper by O'Reilly and uh, Alain Castro, um, and they showed that this this probability to get to the the final state this um, uh, so the the long time um, value of the uh, the final state of the the transport was also intimately related to a, a measure of quantumness which is in this green here so this is to say that uh, there are many possible coherences that you could track uh, in this system so that we uh, in to measure the quantumness of the of the role of this environmental mode uh, as many possible coherences so there are often proxies that are uh, say measures of, of quantumness that are, are good in certain circumstances it's almost chosen here in this green and it can be seen that the the beneficial role of the environment tracks very closely to the quantumness of the environment here so this uh, this uh, the role of this environment is a is a very coherent one it's a very quantum one let's say so in the in the final part of this I'll uh, describe um, the uh, the Fellow Matthews Olson com complex and some applications of what we've the simple mechanisms that we've just discussed into realistic systems. So the Fellow Matthews Olson complex is, is very much a uh, acts in this role of transferring uh, excitation energy. I'm sure some of you will know much better than me on its biological function, uh, but it's, it is uh, something that. Uh, acts in green sulfur bacteria and, and very much in the role of, a, of an excitation energy transporter. It's described by this pigment protein complex, which is essentially a bunch of sites, as I uh, described before, um, of this uh, Frenkel exciton model, where we have a bunch of sites uh, that are all coupled together coherently. And then there's a, um, we have the excitons that are again the, the the eigenstates of this Hamiltonian. So there's now many more excitons that are delocalized to varying degrees, dependent on the different energy gaps and the different um, uh, coupling strengths. And these excitons, as I said, have no ev ev evolution without the environment. And we can expect the uh, uh, coupling strengths to dictate this exciton delocalization. So now these uh, videos aren't working so let me load the video the first so here we have a case of, of weak coupling to an environment this is a simulation of exit uh, energy transfer in FMO um, so in this first case we can see that there's uh, a very weak uh, interaction with the environment and very strong delocalization of the excitation. So these light uh, spots are given by, uh, show where an excitation is hosted. But there's uh, crucially only a single excitation in this system, and you can see that it is strongly delocalized. And you can also see this oscillatory behavior that is indicative of this coherent, uh, coherent transfer of energy that often happens in wave-like manners. So this is a very quantum regime. Um, it's what's often called the Redfield regime of the environment, where the, where the coherent interactions act more strongly than the environmental ones. But we can see that this average transfer time is, is quite high. It's, it's uh, 14 or 15 picoseconds. So then we can look at an intermediate coupling regime and in this case we still have a fair amount of delocalization of the excitation um, but the transfer which happens I should say from the, this red pigment to this green pigment so this red pig pigment will be the starting state the initial state and the, when the excitation gets trapped on this green is when uh, the transfer ends um, but there is, on average now, a much shorter transfer time. Right? So this, the medium strength of the interaction has, has uh, improved the transport rate 
as, as we saw before. Now, the third example of strong coupling, um, we can see that the excitation is essentially localized to a site and then hops between sites uh, as time goes on. And this is essentially a random aspect um, in the strong coupling limit. And this is essentially what's called the Forster limit, where we have random hopping between sites. Um, and this case, you can see, is slower than the medium interaction case. So here we see that there's this complex interplay between the coherent mechanism in the in the system between the sites and the environmental decohering mechanism that acts to to localize the excitation. You don't want too much of this wave-like motion because whilst it goes one way, it then comes back the other. But so what the um, environment kind of does is dampen these oscillatory behaviors whilst uh, in the medium interaction case maintaining the ability for delocalization to occur because this allows the spreading through the system much more easily. So there's a kind of intuitive picture of the role of the environment uh, that can be seen from these sorts of animations. Um, so now let's go back to So what we've seen is that these excitations are collective amongst these systems uh, and the, the environment can increase this transfer rate. Um, and very interestingly as well, these optimal decoherence rates do work out close to the, the measured rates, for example, here. Um, so in, in this, we saw some evidence for this first type of environmentally enhanced, enhanced transport from a uh, numerical calculation that was done within the group of uh, Alea Castro. Um, now, the second example I'll see, I'll relate to an experiment that was done in the in Engels group um, by Higgins et al. quite, quite recently. Um, and here we see some experimental evidence for this vibrational fine-tuned mechanism where there's this vibrational resonance uh, that aids transport. Um, so the crucial aspects to this are that one, that there's a, a peak in the spectral density which acts very much like this uh, local vibrational mode that I described in the simple, simplified model. But this peak has a very similar frequency to a specific energy gap between what in the, in FMO exciton four and two, so it allows this transfer pathway from four to one. So there's a particular transfer pathway, and similarly to some, to what we saw in this video before, that is aided by this resonant energy gap. And experimentally, what they can do is is look at the oxidized version of FMO as well, and what this does is alters the on-site energies because the, of the oxidation of some pigments. Now the, the energies are now different, so this, the resonance is changed, the, the, the energy gap is changed, so now this vibrational mode doesn't, doesn't precisely bridge this gap. Um, so then what is seen from these 2D spectroscopies uh, is that the FMO and OFMO show different rates uh, that is uh, consistent with uh, the theoretical modeling of the removal of this uh, vibrational uh, peak that enables energy transfer through the resonant coherent condition. So here we've, there's, let's say, some experimental evidence. Uh, there are also other models as well, but uh, this is a particularly clean example, say. Um, where uh, this coherent vibronic transport has some uh, experimental evidence. So just to summarize, uh, we've looked at some very simple models of environmentally enhanced transport with both coherent uh, and incoherent method uh, realizations of this and seen that in both cases, um, whether or not the environment acts in a coherent manner 
the exotonic or electronic coherence uh, caused by direct coupling between the sites is a vital and important aspect um, of, of environmentally assisted transport. Um, and finally, we've seen in both theory and experiment that there is some evidence uh, for um, these, the coherent behaviours of, of these systems and this aiding that occurs uh, due to the exoton delocalization, as we saw in the, in the videos. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank you for listening. Uh, you can um, message me with any questions. Uh, at, I'm at uh, University College London, Charlie Nation. Um, and also you can see some very simple examples of some of the, the simpler code here was, is on a GitHub page using this uh, Qtip package for Python. Um, and also I very much look forward to seeing some of you at the conference in Texas in a few days where uh, you can also ask me questions directly there. So uh, thanks very much for your uh, attention and for listening. Okay, so, um, well, as Charlie said, if you've got questions, uh, you have the option of emailing him or tracking him down next week. Um, I think with the, the variety of expertise that we've got in this audience, you could also risk asking some questions now and see if anyone uh, can come up with an answer to them. Um, other than that, we're uh, still <laughs> quite ahead of schedule. So um, we've got, I guess, about 40, 50 minutes until uh, we are going to meet for our discussion section sessions today. Um, I think we'll keep those at the same time, just so those who have um, gone away and come back don't don't miss the start of the discussion, uh, which means you've got a nice long break to go away and uh, have something to eat. And, um, and we'll meet back again at half past uh, the hour, whichever hour it is for you, um, to, to discuss um, some questions and some of the ideas that we've learned about today. <laughs>